I just probably would think so. Move away from Donna. No. Oh, yeah. Ready? Yeah. I try to stay out of the door. I can tell you. I'm going to go I hear from somebody. That was Sean. Uh oh. Oh, now we really have a problem. Now what? He could fit in between Kate and Karen. Bumping money. Yeah, she's getting it's cozy it's and she's getting bumped. And then we're here from Thursday. Monique, do you mind giving up your seat for Mr. Levine? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sean, you're right over here. Oh, oh, here's Rebecca. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we planned this. How do the girls feel about that? I think we have an tag for every possibility. <laughs> really? Because I tried try doing it on my kids. Right here. <laughs> Thank you, Monique. Right. Now that we've covered every awkward possible scenario, <laughs> I think we're ready to start. <laughs> Karen just picked up. Oh, okay. She's calling Amy. Oh wait. Three seconds. Yeah. Oh, you ready? Karen just stepped out to call Amy to see if Amy's in the parking lot or something. Close. So. Did we already do a sound test? I don't know. Did we already do a sound test? Do you, can you tell us? It? You can hear it? You want us to try it? Hello? Good evening? Test? Testing? <laughs> Testing one, two? Okay. You got to do your test. No. You're not going to hear it. It's going to yeah. <coughs> It's just for the camera. For the camera. Yeah. yeah. There Correct. isn't a PA system besides announcements from the office, as far as we know. Kelly, back us up on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll get started, and then so one empty chair. So it should be easy enough. <coughs> So we think this one's wired for the for that speaker, so that yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, we ready? Ready? Yep. Good evening and welcome to the Board of Education meeting for December fifteenth, two thousand sixteen. May I have the attendance please? Mrs. Bealy? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Doctor Miles? Mrs. Murphy? Here. Miss Perry? Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Hobbs? Mr. Vashon? Thank you. Uh, will you join me in the pledge? There's a little flag over there. Oh, don't stuck on each other. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> oh, okay, good. Okay. So 4.0, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Yes, there uh, adjustment to the agenda, table 6.1, meeting minutes of November. Um, the 
The recommendation is to table that. The minutes will be presented at the next meeting, January 5th. Okay. And do we have anyone that would like to um, come up to the podium? Now we're supposed to mark phone back. Um, the podium for uh, public comment. We're going to bring the microphone back for you. <laughs> the space is great, but we don't have microphones. <laughs> Uh, good evening, members of the school board um, and all of our uh, lawmakers here and uh, public officials and, and the general public. I'm Steffi Cox. I'm the director of Project Grace here in Scarborough. I look around and see many good friends um, who've been uh, helping us. And that's why I'm here tonight is to say thank you. We're neighbors helping neighbors. Um, this week we were in the throes of our great holiday giving campaign. 103 children received Christmas presents that were very personal to their likes and uh, sizes and their hobbies. And it was all thanks to a great community effort. Um, and so it will turn into the Academy Awards. I won't list everybody who helped. I wanted to draw particular attention to the teachers and the uh, social workers and the school nurses of our, um, of our wonderful schools who had their eyes out for uh, kids who might need an extra pair of shoes or whose coat is looking a little thin or um, know the personal stories of parents who've confided in them. And as a result, they have uh, made uh, uh, contact with us so that we can help them with that is something that they wanted to have. It's all permission based and um, we wouldn't be able to, to do the work that we do without the outstanding help of the um, staff of the school. So I wanted to bring that to your attention and particularly recognize uh, Cindy Fasula who uh, does a lot of outreach to the nursing department, Christine Gruber in the high school and also um, uh, Sandra Brown, Casey, and all the other fine uh, case workers and um, very loving and caring individuals in our school system. So I just want to say thanks and Merry Christmas to you all. Good night. Thank you. <coughs> I know. <laughs> Okay, so do we need to vote on the table for tabling the minutes? How does that work for the for new business? We don't need to. Okay. Okay, so that brings us to 6.2, appointment of high school winter coaches. Various school staff and community members have been nominated to fill these positions that will be funded through the general fund or booster funded. The recommendation is to appoint the high school winter coaching positions as presented in agenda item 6.2. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion or questions? Jackie? I had a thought this afternoon and it is nothing critical, but I would like some time either at the end of, I think at the end of each season, it would be nice to know how many of our students participated in each activity. I'm talking about the athletic activities now. Because I know it's huge, but we've never had the number. So it's, as I say, it's not eminent, that, but it's just information I think would be helpful to us. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All in favor? Six. Thank you. 6.3, appointment of high school co-curricular advisors. High school... Okay. You want to... Yeah, go ahead. High school staff have been nominated to fill these positions that will be funded from the general fund. The recommendation is to appoint the high school co-curricular positions as presented in agenda item 6.3. Any questions or discussion? Okay. Just a little approval. I'll do second. Yeah, I think it was already seconded. So. Get it? Yep. Okay. All in favor? Six. Thank you. Okay. We're right up to the workshop session. 
Um, first, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Um, we have all the town councilors here and some of our representatives to the legislature, so thank you for coming out. It is a frigid and terrible night to be anywhere but in front of your fireplace under a lot of blankets, so I appreciate you coming. Um, and I will leave it to you. Sure. I was going to um, start off with one apology. I used a template to create the slide deck, so the cover slide is completely inaccurate. You could just put a big giant X on it if you have a copy <laughs> of the presentation. Um, but it is updated here, so you're not going to hear about my goals tonight, but instead um, more of an overview of the district, and I'll get into the agenda. You want now that the microphone is back over there? Do you want to go back over there? Sure. Okay. And then we'll slide out of the way. Getting my steps in today. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Should we slide out of the way so we can see? Yeah. Okay. Twenty first century skills, flexible and handle, right? Um, I wanted to start off um, the presentation by thanking Senator Bolt for being here and Senator Millet. Um, Representative Bashan is also here and we have Councillor Rowan with us tonight, Councillor Chiazzo, Councillor Foley. Councillor Davine um, and Councillor Hayes with us this evening. So thank you all for coming. Um, we also have our assistant town manager, Larissa Crockett, here tonight. And several of our school leaders are here. And um, despite the fact that it's really, really cold out, they work really, really hard during the day and during the week. So I did want to just take a moment to thank each of them and just call out by name because I know um, the camera's a little different here. So I want um, all of our community members to know how committed our staff is. So thank you, um, Assistant Principal Ann Cass for being here, Principal Ann Lovejoy, Director of Curriculum and Instruction and Assessment, and a bunch of other things, um, Lily Culbertson, Assistant Superintendent Dave Currier, um, I mean Principal. <laughs> <laughs> Bard Hathorn, our principal at the middle school, um, Kelly Crosby, our principal here at Wentworth, Allison um, Marchese, who is our director of special services, assistant director of special services, Chris Rohde, Jen, Jennifer Lim, our technology director, Catherine Ruby, um, director of teaching and learning, I remember everybody's titles with a quiz, and uh, assistant principal of the high school, Craig Applestein, thank you so much. And then here at the table we have our director of business and finance and our facilitator director, Pat Jackson, director of business and finance, So if I forgot anyone, please speak now. All right, well thank you all very much for being here. Um, I feel really honored and privileged to have this opportunity to talk a bit about the Scarborough Public Schools with you tonight. Um, I plan to give a brief district overview and some statistics. Uh, I also will talk about some of the accomplishments of the Scarborough Public Schools and know that I will certainly not cover them all because there are many. We'll talk a little bit about the challenges that we face in serving our students um, in today's day and age. Of course, a little picture of funding for us. We'll talk about a few other key issues that are in the pipe um, and taking a lot of our time and attention and thoughts. We'll look at some of the bills that um, we think will be on the horizon as we get into the next legislative session. And really the, the intent of tonight is to think about how can we partner um, for shared success so that we ensure that all of the kids in Scarborough get a really high quality education that prepares them for success. And then that will be followed up with um, a presentation from Ann Cecil and Lisa Swain from Harriman who will talk about our long range plan um, to see them updating that. So it's a full agenda, um, but we hope to keep it entertaining. If not, with a few more, uh, you know, embarrassing things for me, but hopefully it will be important information for you. So I like to start every conversation reminding us all why we exist and why we're here. And so part of my core belief is that um, our fundamental purpose and the fundamental purpose of any school really is ensuring high levels of learning for all students, intentionally bold and uppercase when we talk about all. Therefore, we must do whatever it takes to bring all students to their full potential. And so tonight, I'm, when I'm sharing information with you, it's really going to be about all of our kids because um, we really do believe in the Scarborough Public Schools that all of our kids are all of our kids. So um, 
This, and when I talk about reaching their full potential, that includes social emotional learning, that includes academic um, learning, it also includes making sure that they're enriched through extracurricular activities. So the purpose for this workshop, my, um, my full intent is to really become, ensure that we become the experts that you turn to on any education issue. And that whenever you have a question about what's changing in the educational landscape in the state of Maine and in Scarborough specifically, that you come to us and ask us questions so we can give you um, what, some information on what's really going on um, and guide your decision making as you go into your next legislative session, but also as you're thinking about um, big decisions when it comes to our budget and to the needs of our schools. So first, starting with our kids, we have six schools in the Scarborough Public Schools, most of them know this very well. Um, 2,971 71 students at my last count, so we have a minus a student on any given day. Um, and then let's just give you the breakdown. We do currently have three primary schools. The Blue Point School has 193 students. Eight Corners is the only um, school in our system that is technically a Title I school with 227 students, and Pleasant Hill has 174 students. Um, here at the Intermediate School, Wentworth serves third grade three through five, and we have about 673 students here. Um, and then at the middle school, we're serving students in grades six through eight, with 714 students currently enrolled. And then at our high school, we have 989 students. <coughs> so you should all know that Monday was our first official school cancellation. Um, a big part of that, and the first superintendent, um, a big part of that is coordinating and working with um, our transportation director, also working with our assistant superintendent, Joanne Sizemore, and our director of facilities, Todd Jetson. They were um, up nice and early texting and really trying to figure out, you know, is it safe for us to get all of our buses out on, um, on our roads in all of our neighborhoods? Because as, as you all know, Scarborough is 55 square miles, or sometimes even 56. Um, but we have 29 buses and four minivans that transport our students in and outside of the district, which means that we have um, 20 to 22 full-time uh, drivers. We have five educational technicians that help support students on the buses, and then that's just one supervisor of transportation. And so currently we run three bus routes two times a day, equaling about 450,000 miles per year, um, which is several trips around the world. I think it's like 25,000 miles to go around the world one time, so I'll leave the math up to you, but uh, I learned that little tidbit from my neighbor last year. <coughs> so we have is something that we've been talking a lot about and it seems to come up every year when we're talking about the budget and when Kate just gave us our recent fiscal update. Um, this is one of the, the areas of the budget that I think we need to really look closely at in our next budget cycle because it often is not properly funded in order for us to run this department and um, serve our students or at least it appears that way in the way we're currently budgeting it. But we have an amazing um, director of food service who's doing lots of creative innovative things with healthy, fresh meals. Um, he has one assistant, administrative assistant, three kitchen managers, six cooks and bakers, and 15 kitchen workers. And currently they're serving about 1,200 meals every day. So 98 breakfasts, um, about 1,100 lunches. And uh, one of the things that we're really proud of is our backpack program. And so we um, here at Wentworth have a food pantry where community members are donating all year long. And we're serving 22 families currently um, with about 50 children that are supported. So what that does is with the coordination of our food service director and his administrative assistant, they make sure that on long holiday breaks, um, it's not really a backpack, it's more of a box of food that goes home with nutritious meal options for our kids and our families so that they can stay nourished over those breaks when we're not able to serve their meals here in school. I think it's one of the one of the many important things that we do here is make sure that all of our kids are, are ready to learn by having um, nutritious meals. I'm sorry, can I ask where the breakfast meals are? 
Sure. Um, well, it depends on the school. In the, at the high school, they eat it in the cafeteria. Here at Wentworth, I noticed the other day when I was coming in, it was kind of a grab and go. So they'll grab the breakfast meal and take it with them to their classroom. And the cafeteria. And the cafeteria also. So this is a high school and middle school program? No, it's a K-12 program. K-12, and this is 98 meals a day? Currently, we're serving 98 breakfast meals a day. Yeah. And about 15.7% of our population is classified free and reduced lunch, um, which means that they qualify for either free or reduced lunch and breakfast. Um, <coughs> but, you know, we, we're often wondering, because that's a, a self-reporting system, there is some direct report involved, but we're actually wondering if that's an accurate representation of the needs of our student population. But one of the things that um, I know our school board is really passionate about is promoting the, the school lunch program and the breakfast program so that more and more families will take advantage of the opportunities that, that we present here at the school. And, and even for our little, even for our little guys down in K2, some of them are at the school, even though the school day starts at 9, they're there at 7 for before care and staying until 6 at night for after care. So I know they have to mess with that program as well. Jan? I just wanted to comment on the breakfast, um, that it is 98 meals, but that does not include the a la carte items that kids come in and buy. Oh, yes, I should have mentioned that. We, on a daily basis, we're serving um, about $2,300 worth of a la, carte, a la carte meals. So that's fresh baked goods, that's homemade soups and sandwiches, um, and also can be snack items that students choose to purchase. Thank you, Jim. Did you have and really, leadership, anyone who wants to jump in, feel free. Um, because I'm still learning about Starbo, I do not know about for sure. Um, so I'm only going to briefly talk about our facilities because I know we're going to dig in deep um, when we get into our long-range plan. But um, yeah, Todd is our director, and he's here tonight with us. He has 36 employees and one administrative assistant. We currently have 23 full-time custodians and seven part-time custodians one maintenance supervisor and three maintenance workers taking care of all six of our buildings. And, um, you know, this room, the way it looks tonight for this presentation is a good example of the teamwork and the hustle that our crew has because when I came in at about 6 o'clock, quarter to 6, um, it wasn't set up at all. They were waiting for our direction so that it would be just how we wanted it. And so um, we thank them for their dedication and all the work that they do because our schools are really, really community schools. They're used before school, obviously during school, after school, and all throughout the summer. So it's rare to come into one of our buildings and not find something going on. Um, and the community uses them after school, in the evenings, on the weekends, and in the summer. And um, one of the things that we're really looking at through the health and safety team is how do we ensure that our schools are just as safe and just as monitored after school during those busy hours as they are during the day? Because we do a really awesome job during the day, but there's thousands of people in and out of our schools on any given afternoon um, after the school day ends. So we're really trying to think how do we how do we expand our safety and security to make sure that the facilities are secure and safe. So here's just a few of the recent improvements. I know that there are many, many more. Um, I was just trying to kind of think about each phase level. Uh, some of the things that we're really excited about this year is um, the reinstating of the advisory program at the high school. So every student at the high school has advisory once a week, and then they have an academic enrichment and support time on the other days in the week where they can um, either tag a teacher for support or enrichment, or a teacher can tag them for support and enrichment. Um, and I know that the high school is monitoring the implementation of that this year, but they're also asking questions like, how can we do it even better to ensure that all of our students are getting not only the academic support that they need, but also the social emotional support. And really, we're thinking about how do we educate our kids around some of the challenging social issues that we're navigating um, as adults and what does it look like for them and how can we provide those supports. So the middle school also has um, an advisory period during their homeroom where they're doing much the same. And this year they did add a new program called the Bridge Program, um, which offers support to students in transition or who just need um, a little extra guidance. 
usually due to health concerns, uh, and head injuries, and like that. Thank you, um, at the Wentworth uh, Intermediate School this year that we brought on board an additional STEM teacher. So now all of the students here at Wentworth have STEM year long. Um, and that has been a really huge asset as we're really trying to make sure that we use this building to its full capacity or to its full, yeah, full capacity. Um, and also Kelly's made some adjustments and is thinking creatively about the schedule. Um, we're trying to create as many opportunities as we can for our kids during the day and they want to be engaged in doing a lot during the day. So um, it's always a tricky balance of trying to squeeze out every minute of the day and making sure that it's meaningful for our kids. Um, some big work that we've been doing over the last two years is uh, work around literacy in grades K through five. And Monique has really been leading this up with our instructional coaches. Um, we're in year two with the writing and writer's workshop and year one with reader's workshop. Um, and so there's some really good work happening and lots of celebrations as, as uh, classes we get to the end of the unit. And um, here at Wentworth today, I was uh, up in the red Wing, um, hanging out with some third graders during indoor recess, and I noticed some of their writing that was on display it was Beauty and the Beast, and so it was like their edited version that had like cross outs and even some cutouts and you know, put paper tape together and inserted in as their draft, and then they had this really polished published published piece that was typed up, and so it was really pretty remarkable to see kind of their thinking in progress as I read some of their work. Um, but just one little tiny of what we're doing. We just wrapped up an hour of code also, which I know Monique could probably share a few things about that, but amazing, amazing things happening in our schools every day. This, this list could go on for for days and short. Any other big items, leadership, that, that you want to highlight? <laughs> Yes, and I'm going to add that I might have listed that under a challenge. I might have listed that under a challenge, but I'm definitely going to talk about that. What Catherine was just saying is that on K-12, we've been doing a lot of work around um, identifying learning goals and learning targets that are aligned to the standard as we move towards a proficiency-based learning system. Thank you for adding that. And the high school, of course, you've heard a lot about this, is going through a NEAC self-study which is going to be an essential piece um, to us thinking about where, what are we doing well at the high school and where, where are we ready to go. Um, and that really is taking a lot of their time in professional development and the staff and the leaders are learning a lot through that process. We may not know what NEAC is. Uh, NEAC, okay. I'm not going to remember exactly what it stands for. A NEAC, a New England Accreditation. New England Association. New England Association of Schools and Colleges. And what it is, is we take this year to do a self-study. There are seven standards that um, teacher leaders, along with leadership, are examining our practices, everything from mission, vision, values, um, to curriculum, looking at assessment practices. They're also looking at instructional practices, community support, support assessments. Um, really, it's basically just a self, it's a self audit. And then we'll have a visiting team come next year and they'll spend three days with us um, going over and kind of noticing for themselves and then they'll take some time to look at our self-audit, look at their findings and the evidence that they see during their visit and they'll create a report that will show some highlights of what we're doing well and also um, help support areas where we need to grow. Mm -hmm. um, so our accomplishments, Recently, um, you might have noticed that um, I believe it was the Portland Press Herald had listed, you know, kind of like the top ten school districts based on the new, the latest main assessment, which our students took in the spring of 2015-16. And so we were really proud um, to notice that Scarborough was in the top ten for both ELA and science, and we were like right on the edge for math. Um, so it really helped reinforce to our teachers that all of their hard work and all of the effort that they're putting in is being realized in the outcomes of our students in one way that we measure success, which is the state test. 
of course, that's not the only way that we measure state um, to success. The anecdotal evidence and the observational evidence that we see on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is, is really much more powerful than just that, but it still felt really good to see her name up there in the top 10. Um, we are officially a one-to-one -one district, so we are one-to-one -one from kindergarten all the way up through 12th, uh, 12th grade. This has been a, a huge effort and something that we should all be really proud of as a community. And um, under Jen's leadership, we have been able to have Chromebooks rolled out this year at K2. And we also have um, laptops available for students all the way up through the 12th grade. The students only take the, their devices home um, from 7th grade on up. So the other times they're here in school um, and they're using them to uh, enhance their learning throughout the instructional day. I talked a little bit about the schedule. Um, at the high school, we're in year one of a two-year phase in of a brand new schedule, so that academic uh, enrichment and advisory period was this year. Next year, we'll be looking at moving to an eight-period year an eight schedule. Again, the goal behind all of this is how do we create more opportunities for our kids? How do we let them take the classes and also the enrichment um, courses that they, they need and want? so that they can um, graduate from Fargo High School, not just with a transcript, but with a resume. So we're excited about that work. Um, a big part of the work that the Fargo Public Schools has been doing uh, much before I arrived uh, is focusing on developing a student-centered learning system. And this really is the, the center of all the work that we do. We have one core question that we're always asking ourselves as we're making decisions, is it what's best for our kids? Um, and having this student-centered learning system brings us back to that and reminds us what each of our roles are in that work. What's the role of the parent in a student-centered learning system? What's the role of the teacher? What's the role of the student? Um, and what's the role of the community in supporting those students? And so there's lots of really good work happening around this idea that you know, the students are, are the center of our work. We've also been um, discovering ways to better evaluate our own practice as we make these decisions um, and as our teachers are working in their classrooms, collaborating around their lesson planning and trying to continually improve their practice. And so that's our performance evaluation and professional growth plan. Um, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, that our plan is a model that the state has been using and sharing with other districts. So I'm really proud of all of the leaders who work on that plan and put the effort in to not only put the plan together, because that's step one, but then to make sure that it's really implemented and that there's ongoing um, professional development that supports developing clarity and understanding. So as a leadership team, we are now um, looking at how do we calibrate our feedback and our expectations so that our teachers are getting consistent evidence-based feedback that will help them just become better each and every day. So some of the challenges, um, we are up against a tight deadline to implement proficiency-based diploma requirements for all of our incoming freshmen, which will be the class of 2021. Um, in the first year of the phase in, we are required to ensure that we have proficiency-based expectations clearly articulated to students and families um, in the four core areas, so English language arts, uh, math, science, technology, and social studies. And then in year two, it feels like they're, we're phasing this in, but the reality is in year two, you have the four core and then students get to choose one other area where they're also being, um, they're, that's also competency-based or proficiency-based or mastery-based. These words are used interchangeably. You might even hear some people call it standards-based. Um, all, all kind of getting at the same thing that we really want to ensure that uh, it's crystal clear what kids need to know and do in order to, to reach mastery. And, and by saying that year one is the four core and then year two is the four core plus one, the reality is all of our teachers have to be ready for this work um, because we won't know what students are choosing for their one. Um, and then year three says four core plus two, year four says four core plus three, year five says four core plus, well, all eight, it says all eight. 
So, um, but the reality is our teachers are really gearing up with the curriculum work that Catherine was talking about because that is the most important part of this work to ensure that um, their assessments are aligned to the standards, that their teaching is aligned to their standards, and that they're creating scales and rubrics for kids that are really transparent and they can monitor their own success that gets back to the student-centered piece of the work that we're doing. Um, and, and so that's, that's big work for us, and it's, a, it's an intense timeline, but we're up for the challenge. We're working really, really hard to get there, uh, and I'm confident that we will. Part of that challenge is not having enough time. I've never heard of a school district anywhere that said they had enough time to do all of the work that they have on their plate, um, but we really are stretching our staff to their limits, and this is really important work um, that should be be done. It's not. We're not doing. We're not making the proficiency based um, transition because the state said so. That clearly is a sense, is a sense of urgency. But we're doing it because it's, it is the right work. Um, if we had our our own uh, free will, we would do it in a slightly different way. But um, the time is what's most important. And so um, someone asked me the other day, like if I thought that this, this should be something that was up for discussion or that this should be derailed or that we should you know, take a different course with this work. And my honest answer, I, I don't know if I'm not speaking very well with me, um, is that no, I think that it's the right work and that it won't, as long as we know it won't be perfect um, and we know that it's going to be a growing experience for all of us, teachers, leadership, staff, um, you know, students included, then I do think we should should stay the course. But what I would love to see is that we're getting more support so that we can really do it the right way. Um, I think you've probably heard of some districts who are doing it well and some who, you know, probably wish they were doing it better. We're trying to learn from all of that as we do this work in Scarborough and um, really making sure that the student-centered <coughs> learning is what guides all of our improvement efforts. One of the things we'll talk more about is our um, aging facilities here in Scarborough. So our middle school uh, is 20 years old this year. And we have, um, what you may or may not know, and I know Dan will talk more about this, is that we have some temporary, quote, air quotes, temporary <laughs> facilities um, where all of our sixth grade students receive all of their instruction in modular units. Um, those modular units were put on site the day the school opened. They've been there the whole entire time. And right now we're kind of at the point where we're asking questions that sound like, um, are we replacing modulars with modulars? And so that's partly what Dan's going to be talking about. I, I know what my answer to that would be. Um, and then also all of our K-2 facilities, all of our primary schools, also have modular units as part of their core instructional space. Um, a little different with those, they are attached to the building, so I think sometimes people forget that they're still temporary facilities. Um, and we're using every inch of those facilities, and they really are inadequate in order for our teachers to teach the way they need to in the 21st century, um, because there's very little collaboration space. Um, the gyms are like multi-purpose cafetory museums. Um, <laughs> so our teachers are awesome because they make it work, and you would never hear a teacher complain about the facilities that they had in Scarborough, but if we really want to prepare our students um, for a competitive world, we need to make sure that they have their facilities. Um, and that we can do that. And then, of course, scheduling is always a challenge. Um, we're always trying to finance <coughs> and rethink and reinvent and um, reallocate time so that we can make sure that our schedules show what our priorities are. So it should be that anyone off the street could pick up a schedule at any one of our schools and take a look at it and know what's most important to us. So um, our principals are already, believe it or not, thinking about schedules for next year um, and working with their teachers to start developing them. Even though it's December. So some of our needs, and I put this out there just so that, you know, we're starting to build the conversation and you know that there's no surprises and that we're really thoughtful about our needs when we um, begin to develop our budget. So we need to really think about how do we support um, our existing academic programs how do we support new academic programs and pathways? Um, during my 
kind of listening and learning and connecting to her when I came to the district, which is still really going on, I'm often asked about more technical education opportunities for our kids. And um, I think I can speak for our leadership team when I say that we all believe that we need to think a little bit differently about what we're able to offer our kids, but that requires resources. Um, we would love to create pathways that allow students to discover what they're passionate about or learn what they're not so passionate about um, and, and really have that opportunity to sail forward. But we're also thinking about how do students leave us ready for college, career, and life. And we believe that, that that means we should be creating opportunities for dual enrollment, that we should be creating opportunities for students to earn certification in different fields so that when they leave here, they have that resume that, that we always talked about and that we're always thinking about um, because that's really going to prepare them for success. So we're, um, well, this requires resources, right? Um, and then, of course, the staffing and the schedules to support that and not to sound redundant, but resources to support, um, so instructional resources <coughs> and materials. So if we wanted to create, let's say, for example, um, a health services pathway, <coughs> because we know that by 2020 there's going to be a demand for 3.4 million health service providers, that's nurses, OTs, PTs, speech therapists, um, that requires equipment. You know, we need to have medical equipment in order to have pathways like that. And the same if we were to offer an IT pathway or, um, or a business pathway or a finance pathway or a hospitality pathway. So those are some of the things that we're thinking about and will definitely be explored more as we begin to develop a strategic plan in the upcoming year. Of course, time, you know, I'll always be saying that we need more time, um, but the reality is when you look at the, the countries of, um, around the world that are really, really successful, one of the glaring differences is teacher um, prep time versus teacher uh, work direct instruction time. So when you look at the workload across these countries, and even if, if you're paying attention to what's happening across the nation, um, there's really been a push to give teachers more time to actually get together and talk about these complex shifts that are occurring in our field um, and to make sure that we're on the cutting edge of the best um, curriculum practices, instructional practices, assessment practices. And that's going to be so important for us as we're making this shift to um, professional-based learning practices because it's, it's different. It, it looks different. Um, it requires a different amount of planning. It requires engaging with our students in a different way. And so time is going to be the number one resource for us. And then, of course, um, making sure that we have the right analytic tools to ensure that we're making strategic evidence-based decisions. Um, we're not short on having data in schools. We have lots of data. It's uh, a matter of having the right tools to make that that data interactive and useful so that it can drive our decision making. Whether it's a classroom teacher trying to decide what her kids know and what they're ready to learn, or it's a you know one of our directors trying to decide what's the best next step for us in the programming for our kids, um, or it's it's me and Joanne thinking about you know what are what are the resources and how are we going to prioritize them because we we have to make tough choices. Um, those analytic tools are going to be really important. <coughs> So when we look at our budget, this is our FY17 operating budget. Um, not to go deep into the numbers this time, but just to give you a sense, I think everyone knows um, or has heard us say that the bulk of our budget, 75% of our budget goes to salaries, benefits, and wages. And we all know it's happening with health services. Um, and we all know that people are going to get raises every year. So this continues to be, you know, the biggest piece of our budget. So what we're doing is, um, on the leadership team is trying to be really, really strategic about how we hire, who, who we recruit, how we recruit, who we hire, um, what are the skills that we're looking for, and then how do we retain them by making sure that they're continually nourished per as professionals um, and getting the supports that they need to be successful. And so um, it's a huge part of our budget, but it's a huge part of the time that we invest in our people as well. And then, um, of course, the debt service uh, is the next piece of the pie. And then you have that followed up by the, the general school supplies and equipment. Um, and you can see how it is to be up from there. So the reality is that 
I don't have a crystal ball, and I'm not 100 percent sure what's coming down the pike. I'm hoping that um, our legislators here tonight can give us a little insight. Um, but these are some of the things through, in collaboration with MSMA, um, I was able to kind of brainstorm that I think are going to have some impact on us. So I just wanted to, um, as we wrap up here, talk a little, a little bit about these, but then turn it over to having a conversation about what you think is coming our way um, and how we can partner together to um, you know, let you know what it feels like or what it's, how it's going to impact us and what it means for our kids when these decisions are being made. Um, so the first one is local control of student transfer. And so currently in Maine, um, if a family moves out of the town they live in, you're only supposed to go to school in the town where you live and pay taxes, um, but if a family moves out of town and uh, they want their child to be able to remain in the school district that they're already in, they can ask for a superintendent's agreement. And so when that happens, the parent writes a request um, the superintendents talk about it, and we we talk about all the different factors um, why that that are contributing to why this family might be making this request, and then we decide what's best for the student. Um, if I when I first came to Maine, I didn't know anything about this because in Massachusetts, if you wanted to go to school in a different town, you paid tuition. Um, so it's a little different here. But um, what I think is surprising is that recently. Um, the recent history shows that the Department of Ed is overturning local decisions at like an unprecedented rate. So in 2015-16, last school year, the commissioner's office overruled local superintendents 189 times on student transfers. Only 12 appeals that went to the commissioner's office were actually denied. So the people who know the student, know the family, know the situation, are making the recommendation based on what's best for kids. Because remember, that's why we exist. But yet the, the governor, the commissioner's office, um, is overturning those superintendent decisions. And so the, the, I guess the most ironic part of this, as I was learning about this, and like, what is the superintendent agreement thing, um, is I learned that about 92% of all student transfers are approved, um, but are, are approved at the local level. So the ones that aren't getting approved, it's, it's for reasons. Um, and usually it's because it's not what's best for the family or what's best for the student. And so um, I guess I just make a, a case to say that it's time that we amend this statute and make it clear that students Student transfers through superintendent agreements should remain a superintendent and a local decision. So um, that's one thing that I, I think will probably be on the horizon, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, so call me. I have ideas and opinions about that. Um, <laughs> teacher recruitment costs. So as I was mentioning earlier, this is huge. Um, Recently, what happened was that the state shifted. So back in FY13, the local districts did not pay any of the incurred, which are the teacher requ required retirement costs. Um, in FY14, it was at like 2.65%. Um, and then in FY15, it was at 3.36%. And then this year, we're not quite sure where it's going to go. Um, we have 18% increase, if you put it in about 3.97. Like 3.97. And so obviously this has a huge impact on us. Remember back to the budget pie chart, the biggest piece of our pie. So um, thank you, Kate, for remembering those numbers. So we need, what, what really is the question that I'm hearing among the superintendents in Maine is, what did it look like before? Like, is it different now? Why is it increasing at such rapid rates? And how are we supposed to plan for that? And so what, um, what I would ask is that we make the process more transparent and that we're making the rate setting more transparent so that we know what the projected increases are going to be in the future and then we can be good stewards of our money because we can be planful. The other, um, the other issue that we're noticing are the special education costs in Maine. And so, um, of course, when we talk about the budget, special education is a key driver. We have a legal um, and ethical obligation to fund special ed fully every year. That's the number one priority. So no matter what the costs are, that gets funded first. 
Um, and then all of the other needs are back are funded after that. But that's our priority. In the last 10 years, special ed costs have been going up um, 46%. And there's a whole variety of reasons why they're going up at that rapid rate. Um, but what we need to do is find ways to control these costs while still delivering the services to the students um, who need them. So, you know, an idea might be to put a task force together and include special educators, include advocates um, to, to sit at the table and put together and, and talk about why the costs are rising so rapidly in their district and then also suggest some innovative ways that we can try to control these costs. The biennial budget, um, I'm still learning about this being new to me, but I'm just wondering what's on the horizon for school funding. Um, this year, GPA went up about $15 million, but not all schools benefit from, benefited from that. Um, some schools got less money than they did the year before and others were essentially flat funded. And so what we know is that when you're flat funded, you're actually experiencing a budget cut because those uncontrolled costs, the biggest pieces of the pie, are going up, whether the money's coming or not. And that requires us to go back to our taxpayers to pick up the slack. So, um, you know, this is a big conversation in Maine about how we're going to adequately fund education. And I just wanted to, um, hear from you maybe a little bit about what you think is coming um, so that we can start to plan and think about um, our strategy in the upcoming budget season. Question two, um, this referendum promised an additional one point or additional $157 million for schools, but what's becoming unclear or what's increasingly unclear is um, whether, when that money is going to come and when it comes, how it will be distributed. So what I think is important for everyone to understand is that we're definitely not seeing it this year. I believe that the best case scenario is that we would see it in 2018-19 if we see it at all here in Scarborough. Um, and so I'm just wondering if there will be legislation to implement the referendum and do you anticipate uh, the increased revenue will offset, will be offset by cuts to um, traditional state funding? Just a few questions about that. So I do want to um, open it up for some dialogue and discussion, but um, I do I just want to say again how important it is that we partner and we truly co-labor around this work because as you've heard, there's a lot to do. Um, there's a lot of unknown, but I do believe that when we work together towards common goals, our kids will benefit from that. So again, I thank you for being here, um, and I open it up to questions. Can I suggest that we go back to the uh, slide that had all of the uh, legislative issues, and maybe we take each one of them one at a time and uh, get some feedback from those? <laughs> Right. Um, I'm on the education committee. I haven't been told it's 100% that I'm going back, but um, I think that would be a big surprise to everybody if I didn't. Um, I certainly would invite the other legislators to indicate whether they'd like to talk about local control of student transfers or want me to just jump in because this is something that we have been dealing with in the education committee, and I'm not sure how much you guys have really been hearing about this. Yeah. Okay. Can I add something before you start? <laughs> so the other day I had a great snow day. I had a great meeting with Karen and Amy and we accidentally met for like three hours, I think. <laughs> we were having such a great discussion. Um, but one of the things that I really that really resonated with me and that I learned was um, that that each of our legislators are on their own committee and so Karen is on the Health and Human Services Committee. She becomes the expert on the issues for that committee. And Amy, help me with your committee's official title. <coughs> Labor, Commerce, Research, and Economic Development, as well as Judiciary. All of that. Um, so Amy becomes an expert with all of that. And Rebecca is on um, the Education Committee, so she becomes the expert with that. But, but what um, Senator Volk and Representative Vachon said to me that I thought was so 
impact, like impactful, and I'm sure all of you know this, um, but that when it comes time for them to vote, they have two choices, up or down. And so if we're not reaching out and we're not having conversations and dialogue about these issues, then you're, you know, you're making decisions based on what the committee is mostly recommending unless you have some information that is different. And so that just, for me, was affirmation of why we need to work together and have a partnership. So um, I just wanted to add that before you went. I would just add on to that, that really your input should not wait until it's on the floor for an up or down vote for, for the Senate and the, and the House. By then, any sort of changes that happen are pretty rare, pretty challenging, um, and take a, a, a lot of effort to make any sort of substantial change to the way the report has come out of the Education Committee. Um, but it's good for you to communicate with all the legislators about how you feel about the legislation. But if you want to have an impact on what actually is going to be voted on, you really need to get in there for the public hearing on whatever particular bill it is. Um, expect, uh, definitely reach out to me and let me know what your concerns are so that when we are having a public hearing, I can ask good questions of whomever is presenting that bill and who is saying that this is the right thing to do or this is the bad thing to do. Um, and then also keep that in mind as we're going through the work session on the bill. That is where a lot of our legislative work happens. Mm -hmm. By the time it hits the chamber, it's pretty rare that um, if we, if the, each of our committees mm -hmm. really work hard to get to unanimous decisions because that means the bill is going to move forward and pretty much reach a positive conclusion, uh, or, or negative, or, or yay or nay. Um, if they're divided reports, if, if, there, if there's not a lot of agreement, those bills are pretty much going to die. Mm -hmm. So we're doing, we spend a lot of time in committee having really in-depth conversations, trying to reach common ground, um, and so that is the time <coughs> to massage the bill in a way that you think would be most favorable for Scarborough School or beyond. If I can ask, so four of the five items are budget related, pretty much. So the question I have is that is it more effective to reach out to the individual <coughs> legislator that's on an individual committee or to the legislator that's on appropriation? Uh, both. Mm -hmm. Because the Education Committee uh, will report to the Appropriations Committee what it has voted on and what it's agreed to. If the Education Committee has voted unanimously to support whatever that line item is, the Appropriations Committee, for the most part, is going to say, okay, that's solid. Mm -hmm. um, unless it's really controversial. Mm -hmm. um, the te teacher ret retirement cost is probably one of them. Uh, we've been pretty unanimous as a committee that we, we did not, we resisted as much as we could the passing on of those costs to our local school districts. Um, and we lost that fight. Um, so I would say both, but certainly, make sure the education committee knows what, what, what it is that you would like, and then we can work with you to, to share that with, uh, with the appropriations committee as well. Each committee goes over the budget <coughs> for their areas of jurisdiction. So education will go over the educational line items. I go over Department of Labor, DECD line items. They go over all the Health and Human Services line items. And then that we actually go into and have a joint session with appropriations going through our various budgets. So we literally go through notebooks and look at the areas of disagreement. So to summarize at least one person's opinion, I hope that every single one of you supports education and increases funding in every one of those four areas. So local control. Mm -hmm. So we've been, we, we were made very aware by the Superintendent's Association about the overriding of the local decisions and the extent of which it was happening. Um, recognizing the, the political situation that's been in the existence in Augusta, we have to come to a common ground and get something passed that would survive a potential veto. Mm -hmm. What we put in place was the appeal process. Um, and first it was appeal to the commissioner. Actually, I think that was always in statute. 
what we then said was, okay, the commissioner wasn't having anything, was just not going to support any appeals. There's no, 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 no. And we said, okay, that's not working. So we added the State Board of Education <coughs> as well. It was a, just another, another level. Um, MSMA is very good, and the MSSA and all of those, MSBA, um, they're there every day in our committee. They will let us know whether it's working or not. And so, so if you're telling me that um, they're talking about legislation and obviously it's not working, we will have that conversation again. It does look as though we're going to have potentially a new commissioner. We have an acting commissioner, and that acting commissioner <coughs> has that authority. Um, that's what's been happening, right? I believe. Um, with, uh, whoever is that acting commissioner yeah. is the one making signing off. Now, whether that acting commissioner is actually making the decision right. over the past whatever number of months. That's up for speculation. Nobody really knows. Um, but yeah, certainly recent events with um, Mr. Beardsley's retirement, which are, or, uh, yeah, I don't know what to call it, but um, things will be shifting again. But honestly, I, I've been there for years. I, I do not speculate as to what will be happening next. My hope is, and I think everybody's hope is, that we will get a uh, Commissioner who's been vetted through the Education Committee and confirmed by the Senate. It's a large um, part of our budget. There's a lot of incredible work, as we, we've all heard, that's been it's going on statewide around education. I mean, to not have a, a, a commissioner over this period of time has really hamstrung our schools, our leaders, our teachers, the department itself. Um, so I'm hopeful, but I don't, I don't know. So, so no need to take Sean Keith for instability. No, we know, we, we know. We've, we've, we've had this conversation multiple times. Yeah, no, we. I'm new to me, but it, it takes over every conversation. I know. Like we're trying to have every respective conversation, at least in my mm -hmm. short time. Mm -hmm. Do any board members have specific questions that they'd like to <laughs> but, um, about local control or superintendent's decisions? These folks know that I serve on the Maine School Boards Association Board of Directors, so I've been involved. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely important to me, and always has been, that our legislators think of Scarborough first. And, and help us through the process. Mm -hmm. And it is not an easy job to be an elected official at any level, at any level. And I think as, as the superintendent has said, if we can work closely together to benefit our students in our town, uh, then we're all going to be winners, especially the children. But over the last several years, uh, we have been fortunate in Scarborough that, that we have a town council who is amenable to supporting education because they've had to absorb, for example, a million dollars just in teacher retirement funds. A million dollars over the last two years. That's, that's a chunk of money for a town our size. And for around 3,000 children could do a lot of good in our school. So I'm going to be at the legislature and I'm going to be uh, talking to people and you know, we don't always agree but that's how we're going to get things done. We've got to work together but we've got to listen to each other as well. And I think that's an accomplishment that's within our reach. Thank you. Thank you for coming, by the way. Um, I would just offer an observation on um, the local control of student transfer issue in 
my former role at South Germain Graduates, I oversaw 16 different school sites, and that included, at that time, I think it was 10 or 11 different districts. So I worked with the superintendents in all those districts. And our students were all students who were students of promise. And sometimes those students of promise ended up in that exact scenario. Uh, mm -hmm. Either there was a divorce with family situation. It, we all know there's a lot of reasons why uh, student transfer requests are given. For me, the observation I would just offer is that the uh, perception was that it wasn't consistent between districts. So where one district might, if the parameters weren't really clearly defined for parents, um, and or at least for people, their, their perception. Again, a perception is often someone's reality. So I think it would be helpful um, if there were some consistency amongst districts as to when and why they decide to keep a student and why they, because you are the expert. You are the ones that have the relationship with those kids uh, and their families. So it would be helpful for them to know when you're keeping a kid, why, and when a student isn't necessarily able to stay, also why. And so what I saw over those 11 districts is a lot of inconsistency. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you have that, and, and, and I'm, I wouldn't point a finger either way, um, because I think everybody wanted to do the right thing, but it was more about the perception. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering if I could just get a, an opinion from our, our state representatives and senators. Um, the uh, passage of question two is the second time in recent years that the voters of the state of Maine have suggested that um, <coughs> the, uh, they would like the legislature to fund education at 55%. Um, I was wondering if you guys could weigh in on just kind of the, the timing and the implementation of that. <laughs> I, I think it's hard, it's hard to say. Um, my personal opinion on question two um, is that it's going to result in a net loss of revenue within five years for the state. I think it's potentially devastating for our economy, for our medical care professionals. I was at Maine Med yesterday and they said that there were at least three doctors that they knew of that declined contracts after the passage of question two. I think it's extremely dangerous personally. Um, so I think it's hard to say. I'll just add, you know, on the Health and Human Services Committee, we have a huge problem with networks, networks and providers in, in our state. We are losing our doctors. We do not have a student psychiatrist more of saying for us. This passage of this question, I believe strongly it's going to decimate our doctors' network and number of doctors in, in our state. I have a huge concern from the, the passage of this question. Voters of Scarborough actually voted against this. So I think we do need to pay, pay attention to, to that. And, um, the couple comments, I agree that it, it, the 3% surcharge <coughs> is the best option, probably, for our healthcare professionals. But I think the underlying result of that question passing statewide, because we talked a lot about Scarborough during the budget, and we're told we have to look statewide. So it's, it's hard to pick and choose when we can look just locally and make decisions versus when we have to look statewide and make decisions. But um, I think the fact that it passed, and that's the will of the people, is that they want the state to fund education at 55%. So instead of just saying it's going to kill our, our doctors there in the state, is there a way to look at it creatively where, okay, so can we get to the 55% but maybe it's not the 3% surcharge, maybe there's another way because the people have obviously decided that they want education for the 55%. This is the second time it's been 12 years, right? Is that the point? Oh, margin? Number one, but number two, I agree with you. We do need to honor that, and I think you know there's certainly willingness to do that. And but you know the question is how, given the other priorities around the state, and the fact that now we're losing all of the income tax revenue from people that are paying a high amount of our taxes already. So, okay, so can I? Yeah, I mean, if someone leaves and they t and they earn five hundred thousand dollars a year, how do you replace? 
But that's that. what I'm saying. How can we do it creatively? Right. Well, well, I'm open to that instead conversation. Of, instead of saying it only passed marginally, which shows me that you're sort of like... No, I'm, uh, open, I'm open to the conversation I, for I sure. I think we need to look at it creatively. So I'd like to take a step back because we're kind of venturing down a political conversation, mm -hmm. frankly. Okay. Some, some people supported it. Some people didn't. Some people voted for it. Some people didn't. But the fact of the matter is, is that um, this is going to go into a statute. It will take an affirmative action by the legislature to change the statute that will be put in place by the passage of this referendum. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and so there's a lot of questions that I heard about uh, is this, will this balance cuts to state funding? Will we ever see any money? Et cetera, et cetera. So I'd like to answer some of the more um, process oriented parts of, of what you, you see as on the horizon. This, the, the, the language of the referendum said that this is to go to um, the schools and only the schools for student support and instruction. Mm -hmm. and, and this is important. It is not going to, it's not allowed to go to administrative costs. Mm -hmm. It's very specific about that. It is, there is supposed to be a separate fund um, set up by the treasurer's office to um, manage whatever additional revenues are generated by this surcharge, and it is to be directed specifically to this. Are there people already clamoring for redirecting some of those funds? Absolutely. Um, I have, I've got someone that just within the last week made a comment to me and I was just like, really, already? Um, but, you know, I think everybody, um, for, as legislators, we have to be very clear about what the intent of the referendum was, what the intent of the statute language is. The revisor's office will be putting this into place. I mean, that's what we have to work around. So $150 million, what does that mean for... Based on last year's valuation, which will have nothing to do with the valuation in two years from now. So please take this with a huge boulder of salt. Okay. Um, Amy, can you just let me finish? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, based on last year's valuation, Scarborough would receive about $2.5 million in additional funding. Um, why do some state, why do some districts receive more money, some get flat funded, some lose? We've re, I, I, I apologize ad nauseum, we've been over this, but we have new faces here, I believe. It's because Scarborough's valuation fluctuates in relation to every other school district's valuation. And if Scarborough's valuation is going up, and you have other districts around the state that are in distress and going down, there is a reallocation. It's painful, but, I'm, you know, I've, I have represented districts for, uh, for years now that continue to kind of get hit in the chin. Uh, and it's um, <coughs> not pleasant. But it's also not pleasant to talk to folks from Skowhegan, Rumford, all of these other places across the state of Maine that are really in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so as, a, as a legislator, I'm trying to balance what is necessary for Scarborough, mm -hmm. but what also is necessary for the health of, of, all, of all of Maine. I mean, all of Maine's kids. So, <clears throat> my, you know, so this fund, this money, will raise the overall level of the water, mm -hmm. so I don't, you know, heaven forbid we have another some more seismic economic shifts to happen, but I think we're, we're kind of like right here right now, um, and so there should be some more money coming Scarborough's way. The last thing I would want to say is, some people say, well, Scarborough's getting so much more money than the rural districts in Maine. Yes, in hard dollars it is. That's because Scarborough has more students. Mm -hmm. In percentage increases, rural districts that are suffering 
and are in, experiencing property valuation decreases, they are receiving anywhere from 400% increases, 300% increases, 200% increases. It's, it's, they're, they're, it's big, <coughs> big percentage increases. Mm -hmm. So my, my father is a mathematician, and what he has always said to me is, numbers are funny. You can torture them to say anything that you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, those are, this, those are two important things to remember. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Senator, kind of the question I have is that, so, um, citizens of the main have previously the question about 65% funding and the legislature didn't abide by it. Right. What says that this legislature arranged to one of the one of the Right. Um, it is going to depend on whether the current city legislators abide by the referendum that was passed. Um, there, I'm pretty sure that the legislation and, and or the governor's budget will try to undo it. So you're right. You're right. There's, there's nothing to stop it. So I, I'd like to approach it a little bit from a municipal as well as a state uh, approach. A budget really is just a reflection of a community's priorities. Um, so, you know, everybody is, is, would love to have an unlimited supply of resources, but I think in essence what we're talking about, I think <coughs> the gist of the conversation is that the, uh, certainly the people of the state of Maine and in Scarborough as well want education funding to be a priority. Um, and I think that what I would be hoping from our legislative contingent is that you would uh, respect that requirement and make that a higher priority, let's say, than some of the other things on the plate because um, I think by establishing that as a higher priority, I think we'll be able to come up with some pretty reasonable solutions. I don't think anybody's asking for a full meal ticket to be punched, uh, but I think if you look at the, you know, we've always said from a, from a municipal and a school board perspective, we understand we're a southern main community and we're a contributing community, but it needs to be proportional and it needs to be fair. And I think in, in recent history, um, it's been pretty clear from a statistical standpoint that Scarborough has very readily lost, at, you know, for three or four years out of the last five, we're the biggest loser in the state. And I understand why, um, but when you see uh, similar communities around us that uh, maybe aren't being hit as dramatically as that, there's got to be some mechanism or some way to try and make the process a little bit more fair. And I think to your point, uh, Senator Millett, um, the argument that one group is getting more than the other, my understanding is, is the, the slices of the pie doesn't change. It's just the pie is bigger. Sure. So if yeah. Scarborough is getting 2.7% or 3% or whatever it was of the whole allocation, we're still only getting that allocation, but the pie is bigger. So mm -hmm. by, by the reverse mathematical formula, we then if we lost the most going in, we're probably going to gain a lot more coming out than some of the other districts. So I would just encourage you as legislators to keep that in mind, that um, there are a lot of priorities. I understand that Health and Human Services has their priorities, labor has their priorities, education has their priorities. But I think in, you know, the important thing to remember is that as a community, we, we put education as a high priority. Um, we certainly do it on the municipal side of the budget as well. Uh, and whatever short gap or whatever shortfall is, is happens on the state side, we have to look at it as a community, do we want to make that difference up here? Yeah, and just so you know, um, when the state does not fund 55% in the budget, the rewrite statute to say, okay, the state's only going to fund 47%, and then they rewrite the statute for the mill rate required. Right? So it, what basically what it's doing is it's shifting from um, state revenue to property taxes. So, um, and that's, that was a lot of the driver behind the original 55% referendum and I think continues to be. A um, couple of things. Uh, in terms of creative solutions and how to get the 55%, in the four years that I've been on the Education Committee, where we have, as a, as a group, to various degrees, advocated for additional state funding to try to get us to 55%, we've considered major wins when we get 15 million. 20 million increase. And that's not keeping up with the cost overall I increase in cost of education. Um, and that's after just, just relentless advocating and, and trying to find common ground. 
Um, so when we talk about what can we do to create 150 million in a different way, uh, it's something to kind of keep in mind that each year we're, we're like, woohoo, we got 20 million dollars. Um, last thing, there's a commission formed by the governor, the Blue Ribbon Commission, and I think you should know that there's some discussions happening around the essential programs and services formula and making changes to it. Mm. I and I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways to, 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 mm. to describe what it, what, what it would look like. There is, a, there is a proposal that's been put forward by the former Commissioner Jim Ryer that would make a further adjustment to economically disadvantaged students for districts within enrollment range, in ranges. So if you had between zero and, I'm making these numbers up, 600, you would get adjustment of 0 0.01 per student. If you have between 600 and 1,200, you would get this. I have some serious concerns about that. I don't think Scarborough would fare well um, in, in relation to other districts that have higher um, economically disadvantaged students. So I'm doing what I can to be supportive of the idea that yes, we still, we, we're not, the formula is probably not fully um, accounted for those extra costs in dealing with economically disadvantaged students, but there are other ways that could be more equitable and wouldn't require, and wouldn't result in further pain for districts like Scarborough, South Portland, Cape Elizabeth. Um, there's also discussion around special education costs. Betsy Webb, who's the superintendent from Bangor, made a presentation about a program that they've recently started where there, there's some joint sharing of a special ed high needs facility as a way to try to save some costs. Um, this needs to be, from my personal perspective, has to be treated very carefully because we have gone from a very um, isolated special education environment to the mainstreaming, all in, you know, inclusive environment. And my, from my perspective, is we don't want to swing back. And and Betsy and Superintendent Webb, to her credit, is very sensitive to that. She assured me that the students that are there, the parents are really happy that their kids are there. They're being served very well. Um, so. So that is some innovation discussion that's happening around special education. Um, and I'll try to make sure that everybody um, is, but you guys all should be following the um, Blue Ribbon Commission reports that are coming out um, because there's some pretty interesting things happening. So. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just ask for any final comments as you transition to our update with yeah, I want to make sure that um, board members have a chance if you had any questions um, before. I mean, obviously the superintendent's overview is our priority list and our priorities, but I didn't know if um, anyone had any other specific questions while everyone is in front of us. <coughs> Sorry. I would just, one last thing is, we actually don't know what's coming down the pike yet in terms of legislation affecting education because they're still secret. Yeah. The revisor's office doesn't share titles, doesn't share anything about what's out there. So, so we can't know, really. Because you mentioned, you know, sharing our opinions and, and connecting with you as soon as possible. When's the, the time frame that we can start to have those conversations? Um, I would encourage your office to be on the list, sir, for the education committee. Okay. Um, so we don't have a, we don't have committees yet. <laughs> we don't know, you know, I mean, we're all supposedly have an idea, but we have not been, con been told specifically. And because of that, no committee clerks have been hired. Um, and so there's no list, there's nobody to communicate to yet. <laughs> So what I will do is we can let you know once the committees are up and running 
for you to then reach out and say we would like to be um, uh, um, informed of, and you will get roughly 160 emails or more mm -hmm. of public hearing notifications. Yeah, that's the only problem. You might feel a little overwhelmed. But, but it's yeah. better to know more than less. Absolutely, and I would like to, um, if you're open, exchange cell phone numbers before you leave tonight as well so that we can be texting or calling and communicating and that way. So you can help me kind of sift through the kind of things. <laughs> um, that would be helpful. Great. So, um, Councilor Rayburn and I also both serve on the Municipal Association's Legislative Policy Committee, and we read every bill that comes through, about 1,500 a year, that has to do with municipalities. And so, I think that we can also be a resource to school board as kind of a heads up um, if, you know, if you want to. If you'd like, I'm happy to share with you the bills that we receive before our meetings. We do have three.
various options for consolidating schools, closing buildings, that kind of stuff. The, the latest projection shows it, it's significantly rising, which, which changed basically every assumption that the school committee and the, and the Long Range Facilities Planning Committee had made. And so the data that you're going to see tonight really has to do with that shift in the population, that, that growth that you're seeing overall, and how that might be uh, uh, taken care of. Um, conduct examination of areas of facility improvement that potentially reduce your cost of operations. This, this was a big, big deal for the school committee and for the building committee because they, they, they wanted to serve your kids in the best way possible, but they wanted to look at ways to do that as, as efficiently as possible. And facilities are a big uh, potential piece of that. Uh, look at the potential for expanding the middle school, providing educational equity among all the schools. So whether you went to one primary school or another primary school, basically the resources available uh, would, be, would be comparable. Improving security. Uh, we we uh, created drawings of all the buildings uh, in the school department uh, really for the first time. So you, you now have really good up-to-date scale drawings to do planning with. Uh, create a system of standards to allow the, uh, the school department to evaluate facilities objectively. So we've been working with Todd to come up with a series of criteria that everybody can agree on to say whether a, a, a facility is really serving you well or, or, whether it's, or whether it's not. And we've been using Department of Ed standards to help in, in, in create that, uh, uh, that system. Uh, identifying potential funding sources. We're going to talk about applying for uh, Department of Ed funding tonight for your facilities. Uh, and then ultimately to create a long and short term capital improvements plan that will help you prioritize scarce resources uh, to have the most effect in your, in your schools moving forward. Um, so one of the things we looked at first was building capacity, student enrollment, um, and, then, and then the projections going forward. So if you look at page four of your, of your handout, what it basically says, and again, there's, there's, this is a 25-page distillation of uh, what is now over 100 pages of data. So I invite you to look at the, at the, at the bigger report because it has quite a bit of, of, of information in there. But when the projections were redone in January of 2016, these were the numbers that came up. I like the fact that it scrolls. Yeah, <laughs> and you clearly you can see it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I, I, I was thinking we were be talking mostly about numbers, and, and which is why we made uh, handouts for everybody. So the, the first column to look at is the one that says uh, capacity using Scarborough sta standards. Every school district has a set of standards that they like to, to, to live by that says that in, let's say, grades K-2, that you'd like to keep your class sizes, say, from 16 to 18, perhaps, and then higher grades, uh, more and more students per, per classroom, uh, because of all the research that's been done that says that, that you, know, you should try to uh, match students per, per classroom uh, with their age in, in, in the way that will make it uh, best for them in, in terms of learning. So we used those standards for Scarborough and we, we did a literally a room by room inventory of every room uh, in every building in your school department and came up with these uh, numbers. So the, the Blue Point School has a, a, a capacity, I would say a comfortable capacity for 241 kids, eight corners, 236. So if you go down the list for the primary schools together, you have capacity of about 655 kids uh, in, this, in the district. Um, actual student population right now, you have 594 kids in that, in that grade uh, level. So you're about 9% under capacity. And that's a pretty good number. You shouldn't, the closer you get to your capacity, uh, typically what happens, you have more and more and more trouble uh, providing space for all the programs that you need uh, in, the, in the building for, for the kids of, of all kinds of demographics. So having, you know, 15% extra capacity, something like that, is a good thing. It's not a, it's not a bad thing. If you've got 30% too much capacity, then you may have more space than you have kids, and you should think about uh, potentially consolidating. And that's where the committee was a year ago, uh, because the, the numbers were, were, were dropping uh, significantly. The new projection that was done by Planning Decisions has two, has two models. One of them is called uh, the Best Fit Model, and that's a sort of traditional model where they look at uh, pretty much only at live births in, in the school department. 
And it's a limited model. In the past, it, that model has not uh, taken uh, account of, of a lot of things, uh, especially that happened in the southern Maine in terms of growth and development and things like that. So the second model that they used in the latest projections is called the new housing model. And in that, planning decisions talked to your uh, 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 town planner, and they looked at acreage that was available for development, they looked at building permits and all kinds of other things, and those numbers are, are higher. And what's interesting is those numbers are right on your actual population. So if you look at uh, row four, uh, the, the subtotals, you have uh, 594 kids right now uh, in, 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 the, in the district of K2, and the projection, the new housing projection says you should have 593, so it's, so it's a bullseye in terms of projections. This is important because the, the other thing that the, um, that the projection shows is that at the end of the 10-year uh, projection uh, fiscal year 2025-26, uh, you'd have 746 kids in, at the primary school level. And that's about a 14% increase over what you have right now. And that's a, that's a big number. That's a, that's a lot of extra kids. And again, so the, the whole mindset of the board and the committee was to, to now look at how you would accommodate these additional kids coming, coming forward uh, in the future. If you look down at the bottom row uh, of these numbers, again, the new housing numbers um, uh, for, for the entire school district are right on top of the numbers that you're actually experiencing. So we think in general, the first thing to note is that that new housing model is a good tool for you to use in making decisions going forward about what you might do with your uh, facilities. So if you go to page six of your, uh, of your handout, the next thing we looked at was the state of the facilities both from an educational standpoint and from a facility standpoint, just sort of you know, the basic uh, bricks and mortar standpoint. So the first piece of this, uh, the, the page four, excuse me, page six and seven, <laughs> talk about the uh, the things that we learned both from our school tours and from interviews with the principals and uh, discussions with with, uh, with Todd and all the things that, that come to his office that need repair or are problematic. So in the primary school and the middle school, again, I won't, I won't read through these in detail, but there is a, a fairly long list of shortages of space that primarily have to do with either not enough rooms uh, for programs or rooms that are too small for programs or rooms that are inappropriate for, for programs or they may have uh, a lack of utilities or plumbing or, or power or uh, those kinds of things. But pretty consistently through the, those four schools, the three primary and the middle school, there are a lot of uh, shortcomings that, that uh, should be addressed and, and they, they make it harder for teachers to get the work done that they need to because of lack of space. The middle school in particular is, is, is acutely crowded. I think Barbara would, would, would agree with that. Uh, and and what's, what's odd is that you have a lot of classroom space at the middle school, but 12 of those classrooms are in modulars. And then uh, there are core spaces in the middle school that are substantially smaller than they should be. The cafeteria, for, for example, is only 63% of the DOE recommended size for your population, so they have five lunch servings. Is that still true, Barbara? No, now we're down to three. Oh, you're down to three. And we use uh, our overflow. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so in order to, to <laughs> five lunch servings is, I mean, you start lunch about an hour after the bus, bus has come, and you're eating until you know uh, two thirty in the afternoon. Uh, so, to, to to take care of that problem, what Barbara has done, there's a big lobby space that uh, that runs through the STEM area going to the cafeteria and they're eating in there. So they're eating in the hallways uh, basically which I, you know, I'm sure has more than one building management uh, problem associated with it. Um, uh, special ed spaces seem often to suffer in situations like this when the building's really overcrowded because you start putting functions in rooms like closets or former storage rooms and things that really just weren't uh, ever designed to, uh, to be a good place for kids. The, the other odd thing you have in the middle school is there are these, when you go from the classroom wings to the center of the building, the core space, you have to, you have to pass through this narrow gauntlet. Uh, the, the code says that the absolute minimum width of a, of a corridor in a school, uh, it, it has to be six feet. And in those hallways that, that are about 30 or 40 feet long, uh, they're at seven feet. And some of those hallways have lockers on one side, so they're actually down to six feet. 
And so you're, you're pushing a couple hundred kids through that every time classes change. And, and it's, it's just uh, not a good way to have the, 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 the school organized. The library is 850 square feet smaller than it, than it should be. The gym is a, is a nice space when you first look at it, but it's not a competition size gym. It has a great uh, elevated track around it, but that elevated track makes it hard to shoot baskets from the corners of the, uh, of the court because it actually hangs out over the, uh, the basketball court. So there, there's, a, there's a variety of things that, that need to be addressed. They have one art room that is 54% uh, of the size of the deal we recommend for an art room. So uh, again, a lot of compromises and, and uh, a pretty creative planning have to be done to make all this possible. Middle school also has, uh, at least in 2015, had five floating teachers. Those are teachers who just don't have a classroom, so they spend the day in carts, and wherever, from a scheduling standpoint, there's a room that's empty, they move to that room teach that class in the next period they may be in a, a totally different part of the building. So we, we look at all that uh, as well and some of the options that we'll discuss with you today are intended to look at things from the educational facility side as well as trying to accommodate the, the growth that seems to be uh, moving through your, your younger grades and presumably they'll, they'll end up in your, in your upper grades eventually. On page uh, 8 and 9 of your handout, in fact, I think this is part of my... Oh, that is it. Okay. We, we did a table <coughs> called Classroom and Core Space Comparisons. So what we did is we, as I said, we measured every single room in every one of your schools, put it together in a chart, compared it to the Department of Ed standards, and again, I, I want to stress that those standards are, are pretty conservative. The Department of Ed uh, is not likely to oversize something because they have financial constraints and they've got to have you know, equity in the money that they, that they give for planning schools from Kittery to Madawaska. And so they've come up with a series of standards that are based on research that they've done nationally. And they're pretty reasonable standards, but they're not overly generous. So meeting the DOE standard doesn't necessarily mean that you've really got enough space for a given program, but and all of the... Could I just add, yeah. evidence, like rock solid evidence of that would be our middle school that was too small the day it opened because yeah. it met the DOE standards and not and right. right. a state funded project. And it was a fully state funded project. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so all of these yellow boxes that you see in this chart on page, um, page 8 of your handout are areas where your, the rooms that you have are substantially under the DOE standard. And not surprisingly, uh, most of those are at the primary schools and at the existing middle school. And again, I won't go through all of these, but things like typical classrooms, uh, too small, art rooms, music rooms too small, using stage as a music space because they don't have, a, they don't have any other place to do it. Um, the cafeteria, as we've already noted, in the middle school is, is very, very small, and it goes, it goes on and on. As Julie mentioned earlier, um, I, think you should, I think you should patent that word, gymnasium <laughs> corner or something like that. In, in a new building, you would always separate the cafeteria space from the gymnasium space because the gymnasium space is a teaching space. It's not just for kids letting off steam. And, and if you're smart in the way that you plan the building, the cafeteria should, could be a teaching space as well. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's very, very important to, to separate them when you combine them. It reduces the time that kids have for recreation, PE, and, and, and health classes uh, in, in general. So uh, it, it, would be, it would be good in a perfect world to correct that at some point. The middle, the, uh, middle school and the uh, three primary schools also don't have a stage, and again, these days, uh, you would have a stage even in a small elementary school because performing arts and getting kids to learn to speak and, and perform in front of other people is just very, very important for their social development and, and, and confidence building and all those kinds of things. So, so again, so, so that, that chart represents the difference between what you have and what the DOE says you, uh, says you have as a, as a point of reference. The next thing that we did was, I this works, half of that chart. The next thing that we did, and, and to this I'll refer, that you have an 11 by 17 in front of you, because this particular chart, uh, even with glasses, it may not be legible. I think it has, uh, you know, 1.5 uh, point font in it. 
But that, uh, that chart will be on the last page of your 11 by 17. As part of the physical inventory of the buildings, we went in and we looked at all of the uh, uh, construction documents for the, for the buildings originally so we could understand how they're made, how the walls are made, how the roof was made. Uh, we spent a, a lot of time uh, with Todd taking down ceiling, time, ceiling tiles, looking up above, looking at structure, looking at insulation, that kind of stuff. And we found some pretty, pretty glaring um, uh, issues up there, which again, uh, many of which can be corrected, some of which are pretty difficult to correct. But if you look <coughs> at, at the beginning uh, for the Blue Point School, and you look at row five, and you go over a few columns and you see a, a red number, uh, a red number three. Uh, three is the R value of, of the walls, of the exterior walls of the original uh, wing of that of that building. Uh, what you have is an R value of three. What you should have is an R value of 20.5. So um, no matter how energy efficient you are, no matter how good you are in, in terms of controlling your use of oil and things, you, there's a limit to what you can what you can do when you have a discrepancy of that size. The 1993 wing of, of Blue Point has a wall system that are 12.8, but again, they should be 20.5. And if you go over to the right of that and you look at the roof insulation and roof structure, the original wing of uh, Blue Point has, a, it has an R value of 15, it should be 38. So it, it became very, very clear very early that the primary schools um, were probably consuming a lot more energy to, 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 to take care of their, of their needs than they should. And sure enough, that showed up uh, in the numbers. We got a, a series of spreadsheets from, from Kate Bolton uh, looking at three years of your actual total expenses to run these buildings. So that's oil and gas and water and sewer and uh, staff salaries and benefits and all those things. What we're, what we're trying to do is to try to get a, 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 a number that would say, okay, this school costs about this much just in and of itself to run uh, because that's, that's good basic data for any changes or, or for spotting any problems that those facilities might uh, might have. So when we, once we did this this chart, we knew that there were going to be problems at the primary schools in terms of, of uh, inefficiency, and that in, case, in, in fact uh, became the uh, uh, the case once we looked at the numbers. So the next we go to the next page or page 11 of your handout. Operations and maintenance costs. Uh, this, this is always uh, a really interesting and revealing uh, thing on, on sort of the pure facility side. And again, with the overarching goal of wanting to uh, make the most use of, of, of scarce uh, financial resources and at the same time deliver a really high uh, quality of education for your, for your kids. So the primary school, uh, there are a number of reasons why the operations and maintenance costs were high. Not enough insulation, as you saw before. The building envelope is pretty loose in some places. There was one day we were at the eight corner school, and we pulled off the ceiling tile, and we looked up, and there was a vent pipe that went through the roof, and we could see blue skies, like we could see clouds moving. Like, well, that's not that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing to have a hole through the roof where cold air is coming in all the time. And, and as you might expect, teachers in that area often complained about uh, their rooms being too cold. So you can pump all the heat you want to in a, in a room like that, but if you have a hole that was six inches in diameter, it's going to be a, a problem. And this and this is in the uh, the modular wing of the of the school. So it's one of the things that that comes up sometimes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you, the schools are small. Uh, you know, anything under around 400 students per school would be considered a small school. And although small neighborhood schools have a really good rap in terms of teachers getting to know students and students getting to know teachers and, you know, the whole idea of being able to walk to school, all those kinds of things are, are wonderful. But putting that aside from a purely economic standpoint, they're, they're more costly to operate. And all three of your primary schools are, are, are substantially uh, below that, uh, below that number overall. What's interesting is when we look at these numbers, you, you'll see that the uh, dollar per square foot cost for the primary schools 
are not that much uh, less than the middle school. However, the middle school has air conditioning. And so you would think that the primary schools, when you compare them side by side, would have much, much, much lower operations costs than the middle school because of that. that just having air conditioning in the building it, it, it represents a substantial increase in infrastructure uh, and uh, operations costs, but also all the studies say that uh, having air conditioning uh, is, is really great for uh, uh, eliminating indoor air quality problems and, and uh, increasing productivity of students and teachers, because teachers are people too, and uh, they like to have you know, good, good climate control in their, in their buildings. Uh, so that, that's another example that the primary schools are, are just more costly than they should be. The Wentworth School, and I'm not, I'm not um, uh, trying to toot our, toot our horn, but we were very... You toot away, Dan. Kelly <laughs> 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 is completely responsible for the operations <laughs> cost. <laughs> and, 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 and Kelly and, and uh, Jackie. And Christine. Um, and Christine. Don't forget Christine. Yes, yes, and Christine. Um, we did, as a part of the referendum, we, we have to do a projection of what we think the building operating costs will be. And so far, uh, it's been about $35,000 a year less than, than what we had projected. Uh, and it's because you have new technology and you have, you know, modern wall and roof systems and very good insulation and, and all that. So there are, there are advantages to that. Um, on the next page, which is a table on chart on page uh, 12, Again, I try to highlight since I'm, I'm putting so much data out to you in a, in a relatively short amount of time, and I expect all of you to read this over the holidays. And, and <laughs> um, try to highlight things that I wanted to point out. So on row three uh, of this chart, which takes all those costs that Kate gave us, and we, we broke them out by school, and we broke them out in different categories so you could see it's a really good way to compare uh, schools within your district. So on, on row three, you see that the intermediate school, uh, where we are right now, $5,200,000 uh, a year basically for all those costs uh, to run. But the middle school is, is, is uh, $5.8 million, almost $5.9 million. The key thing here is that the middle school is 60,000 square feet smaller than this building. And yet, it's you know six hundred eighty-one thousand dollars a year more expensive to operate. The middle school has air conditioning like this building, but it has an, an older technology, and that technology is twenty years old now. It has no cooling tower out, out of the back that you may have seen. And so, they, the, the the study recommends that if you were to do a, a major renovation addition to the middle school at some point in the future. You should seriously look at upgrading all of those systems, and you'll get a payback from that that could be uh, pretty significant. But again, we were again, just surprised to see what the delta was between those two buildings, given the difference in their size. If you go to row five, you look at dollar per square feet, <coughs> you divide all that out, and you see that the three primary schools are pretty high. You see that um, the high school and the intermediate school are, are pretty, uh, pretty close to each other. And then you see that the uh, Scarborough Middle School is in between, but it's 50% more costly per square foot to operate than, uh, than the intermediate school. And again, that, that number has not only utilities in it, but, but uh, uh, staff costs. And I don't know if there's a difference in, uh, it may be that, that the, the number and type of teachers that you need for those two programs may have something to do with that. But again, it's, it stands out. If you go down to row 10, where you're looking uh, only at the physical plant costs, not staff salaries. Again, you see pretty close clusters for the three primary schools, and they're twice the cost of, of the intermediate school and twice the cost of the high school, and they're pretty close to, uh, to, the, to the middle school. So there, there are a number of things that you could do. If you, were to, if you were to keep all four of those buildings basically the way that they are, there are a number of things that you could do going forward that would help uh, reduce your operations costs. As, as, as we said earlier, there's a certain amount of money that you have to spend every year just to have your doors open, so it would be good to uh, try to reduce that in the facility time. Yes? Yeah. <coughs> Could you specify what, what staff salaries are included in life? Is it, is it everyone, all teachers in the school? Yes, yeah, all staff. teachers, administrators, uh, custodians, kitchen, uh, everybody. So staff salaries and benefits. Again, it, it, the idea is to try to take a financial picture 
of, of an individual school to compare that to another school in, in the district. I mean, there are a lot of variables that, that are maybe different from one to the other, but it's a, it's a useful way to find where there may be anomalies and then to develop a plan from the facility side to, uh, to address them. And yes. could oh. I, I just add, um, I'm looking at the plan that has the previous year's square footage, so like where line 10 is. If you looked at what it cost us um, for all physical plant costs, um, in, in the 2014 report that was done, it was $11.40 per square foot for Blue Point, $13.10 for Eight Corners, $13.98 for Pleasant Hill, three dollars and eight cents for Wentworth, and that would have, um, uh, I'm sorry, this is December 15th, yeah, and then it was five or I'm sorry, I'm saying three in the wrong line, four dollars and forty-five cents for Wentworth, eight dollars and um, eighty-two cents for the middle school, and two dollars and sixty-five cents for the high school. And the point is that that the energy costs last year, as we all know, were much lower. But in the previous year, it was almost double, and in some cases, triple at the primary schools than it was in some of the other schools. So, mm -hmm. although that has to do with the fact that the primary are fueled by uh, natural oil, right. and the other buildings are not. Right. And it was a colder winter than it was last year. So I just, when I first came here, I saw these numbers, and I was like. This. Because they're literally triple in some cases, sometimes five times as much. And so these numbers are, you know, they look closer than, but just know that you could have that variance from year to year. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, yeah. What are, what's the, high, what's the high school needed by? Natural gas. Natural gas. And then this is geothermal. Is this geothermal? Yes, yeah, it's also, and that's it also has, handy, correct? Yes, yes. But it also has natural gas as Back that additional source of heat. So it seems surprising to me that the high school bachelor's less expensive than Well, it's not fully air conditioned. Right, it's not fully air conditioned, and you're also uh, you're taking the cost and you're amortizing that over a, a large amount of square foot. You have 300,000 square feet in the high school, and a, and a, a piece of that in the basement, a pretty sizable piece, is just storage. So it's just not going to consume the amount of energy that a classroom uh, would consume. So the, the high school is a, is a little bit different than the other than the other ones, but it, again, it's a good it's a good place to start and and then use that as a as a, a measure to compare the other other schools. Here. But it's also a testament to the air conditioning. If, if done correctly, yeah. it isn't prohibitively expensive right. to operate a fully air conditioned building if it's done. I, exactly, and, and, and again, the, the, the benefits in terms of indoor air quality and productivity are just off the, off the charts. I mean, I have dozens and dozens of studies that have been done nationally about that, and if, if you wave a magic wand, every every school that gets built ought to have air conditioning, and it just uh, really, really helps, helps with asthma and allergies and just you know, on and on and on. Um, the other thing is, is we don't lose boilers in the middle of the winter. Right. And, and we, since I've been on the school board, we have had that problem, the old Wentworth, for example, and I think once at the high school. Pardon me? So, uh, different systems run more efficiently, and and our, our two, uh, our three elementary schools have not been updated since before well, if the middle school is 20 years, it must be 23 or 24 for the, for the uh, elementary schools. <laughs> <laughs> we have 23-year-old boilers. Five of the six boilers in the K-2 schools are 23 years old and getting tired. And we're, we're really waiting for natural gas to go down those roads. Uh, yeah. It's going to be a long way. The only good news is the oil price is so low that I locked in at last year. I'm at a dollar forty-seven a gallon for oil. So it's going to, they're going to, those schools are going to look great this year because the oil prices were got lucky and locked in at the bottom of the curve. Right, and, and the reality is they look even better if they were properly built and well yeah. insulated and, and that, that kind of stuff. So again, I mean, it, it's, it, for schools, it's really a zero-sum problem. If you have to spend more on facilities, you're just going to have less money for other things, and there's just not that much room for uh, for just adding and adding and adding 
uh, additional costs. Um, if you go to page uh, 13, some more metrics, and I, I won't bother going through them right now, but again, you can see that the, the, the premium and in terms of operations costs looking at, at various things that the, that the primary schools have. If you go to page 14, what we're trying to do is to compare the, the um, heating costs of one, one school to another. But because Wentworth is geothermal, Wentworth uses a lot of electricity uh, for, its, uh, for its heating and cooling. It also uses natural gas for, for heating. You can, you can tell the system to use more natural gas and less electricity if you want to. Or if you, the, uh, the system is designed for a certain maximum level of cold, if you have a really, really nasty winter, then the natural gas there is available to, uh, uh, to, to supplement that difference between what the system's designed to do and what it may have to do in, in a really bad winter. So we, we, we've done separate numbers for electricity and separate numbers for heating for all the buildings. But in order to do an apples to apples comparison, we thought it was important uh, to combine heating and electrical costs and then look at the six buildings and see where they are. So again, if you look at row uh, five, the, the middle school, you know, $1.49 a square foot. Wentworth is $1.13 a square foot. Again, that's, that's a difference in wall construction, roof construction, uh, better technology in windows, you know, a really good technology for, for, for cooling. Um, you know, it's not that the middle school is a bad building or anything, but it shows you where, if you were to do something in the future, you should definitely think about upgrading those things. And again, it shows that the, that the three primary schools are on the, on the upper end of, 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 of what you're doing. Um, and again, this, this is where, you know, if you look at the middle school number, $1.49, you look at the primary schools in the $1.40 something range, they're, they're, they're pretty close, but they shouldn't be. They should really be different because the middle school has air conditioning and the three primary schools don't. You would expect to see a, a much bigger delta between those things. So again, it just shows that, that uh, the primary schools can use some help. So on, on page 15, in terms of looking at potential options, and again, if you look at the... Uh, Is there a way to like get it to just go exactly where I want it to be? If I found the table, I can do it for you. Well, you have this chart in front of you. Um, so there were seven options that, that were looked at when you were looking at reducing the amount of square footage you had when the population was like it was really going uh, lower. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, that's good. That's perfect. Um, but for this, because because of this change in population and additional meetings that we've had and work that we've done, uh, we've come up with, with six options looking at what we know now in terms of what is out there for populations and the, the issues on on energy use and uh, facilities are still the same, with education facilities. But there's, there's a number of other things we want you to, uh, to look at and think about. So, so the first option A is the, on page 15, is the maintain the status quo. Basically, do nothing new to the buildings. You would simply uh, put band-aids on stuff that's broken when it breaks. You would, you would only send the, the minimum amount of money that you need to or that you can afford to uh, to take care of your facilities issues. And that's a reasonable strategy, especially if um, one of the goals is for you to apply for state funding. So it wouldn't make, make sense to put a half a million dollars into your facilities uh, until you wait and find out what the state says and whether or not they might uh, give you some money to, uh, to do that. Um, so that do nothing option is also very helpful. Uh, and actually that's the blue line, that's the, that's the top line because we can model financially um, the return on investment, the cost benefit of uh, any option that you might come up with in terms of consolidating, adding on, energy upgrades, any of those kinds of things. So for RSU 21, which is Kenny Bunk, Kenny Bunk Court, and, and Arundel, before they did their building, uh, we, we did a series of studies. And we took the existing costs, in this, in this case, uh, this was option 4A of, 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 of 7 that they looked at. And we, we, we got all those costs from, from their business manager, and then we ran those out 24 years into the future. 
and we, we just said, well, let's let's assume it's going to be a two to three percent annual increase going out to the future, just as as a, as a basis. And what's interesting, what was interesting for RSU 21 is when they did that, they saw that in 20 years they would have spent 80, 90 million dollars on their little uh, elementary schools, just you know, not much bigger than than uh, what you have right now. So then the committee started thinking, well, if we could just tweak that a little bit every year going out 24 years, that 80, 90 million dollars might be, maybe it's going to be 75, maybe it can be less than that. So again, they started thinking about options in terms of both uh, providing the, the educational spaces that you needed, but also trying to figure out ways to reduce the operations and maintenance costs. So in this particular option, uh, they had four elementary schools. And this option, they said, okay, we're going to close two of those four elementary schools because their, their population was, was like falling off a cliff. It was like a, almost like a 45 degree uh, angle and it continues to be that way. So they knew that they had to uh, take some buildings offline. They just had much, they had about uh, 600 students worth of excess capacity in the district in their building. So, so they were spending a lot of money just to have these buildings open, and it, it, it didn't make sense. And, and so in this in this scheme, they would close two elementary schools. So all those kids would then have to go to the other two elementary schools. So those buildings would get substantial additions and renovations and upgrades. So they would they would meet all the educational programming standards that they wanted to, and they would also be much much more energy efficient. We would basically rip out the electrical and mechanical systems and completely replace them and use, uh, use modern technology. So there was a construction cost for that and in order to make a fair comparison between what all these renovations and additions, uh, this improved efficiency might do compared to the sort of do nothing option, uh, we also, we called the main bond bank, we got a, a schedule, we, we did a construction estimate, we got a schedule for the bond repayments and we put that into the spreadsheet as well. So those two, the red and the blue lines, the blue is the do nothing and the red is the, the option 4A with all of these improvements, uh, start out at the same point and you can see that there's a note there that says start the bond payment. So when that happens, the red line goes up pretty quickly because your bond payments at the beginning are, are, are higher than they are as you go along. But the consolidation, which, took, which would take about a year and a half to get all the construction done, the consolidation was saving substantial amounts of money in operations and maintenance costs. So eventually what happened is those red and blue lines crossed so that the option 4A, the red line, became cheaper than the, option, than the do nothing option. And over time, that gap kept enlarging and enlarging and enlarging. So at the end of 24 years, uh, the, the projection was that they would save about uh, uh, $8 million over, over the do nothing option. So you can do a lot with $8 million uh, if you think about it as a return on investment uh, in, from, the, from the very, very beginning. Um, and in the final, the final year of the comparison, they were going to save about $838,000 just in that one operating year. Now, we played with it with different percentages of inflation. 1%, 2%, 3%. And what happens is those lines still cross and you still get savings overall. The angle of it might change a little bit. Um, if you have a, a spike in energy in one year, say halfway through the bond, both, both lines will get steeper in terms of their cost. So their relationship to each other is, is what you really want to look at, not, not what the absolute total dollar amount might, might be. But you can, you can set up spreadsheets and model this pretty easily for example, if you wanted to either repair the, the primary schools or consolidate the primary schools into a new building, this is a tool that is, that is available uh, to do. So we wanted to, to, to show you that. So that's, that's part of option A and what might happen. Uh, back on page 15, option B would be, uh, again, pretty simple and conservative. Just renovate the existing schools that you have in place um, and improve their, inefficient, their energy efficiency and durability, things like that. And then you could think about replacing the modulars in each of those. Again, there are 12 modulars in the, in the primary schools, and, and that would also help substantially. Again, you can model the return on investment for that. Option C on page 15 is um, new construction. We, we, 
We got to talking at the committee level about replacing your existing modulars, which again are old technology and not very energy efficient, although the manufacturers would probably claim that they are, with, with new modular construction of a more permanent kind. And, and by modular, I mean that there, there are companies in, in the U.S. that will build classrooms uh, in a factory and then take the classrooms and put them on a foundation. So they claim that there are savings to do that because they control the conditions of construction and that the erection time is much uh, much quicker, et cetera, et cetera. So Julie asked us to look at that, and I contacted a company uh, in the greater Boston area. They were, they were a little bit helpful, but they really, you have to go to them with a, with a pretty concrete floor plan for them to say, okay, it would cost this much, and then we can compare that to conventional construction and see if there is any difference. Because they gave me uh, price differences of $188 a square foot up to $300 a square foot. Well, that, you know, that, that's a 50% uh, swing, so that, that doesn't help. But if, if you were to consider something, this would be an avenue of research that we could do to see what, what, what it might, how it might benefit, benefit you, if at all. My, my sense is that every manufacturer has a different way that they build things and different different way that they do it in the, in the factory. And so you really have to do a very detailed analysis. If, if, you know, are, you, are you getting that R value in the wall of 10.5 that you really want, or are you, are you not? That, that kind of thing. But it, but it, it would be an option uh, uh, to do. On page uh, 17 of your handout, in this one, this, this was something that we looked at uh, early on. Uh, new construction, you basically would close the three primary schools and then build a new consolidated primary school on the municipal campus. So if you turn to page 18 for a second, you'll see drawing. I'll try to get close enough. That's why I always like to have hands. Because um, people can hold in their hand and look at it. So in this, this idea, uh, you see these two shaded areas on the right-hand side of the plan. This, the idea was that you would, you would build a consolidated primary school, K through two, um, could be as many as 750 kids, if you look at the uh, planning decisions projections, on your municipal campus. And there's a couple of places where you might be able to do it. But I, I, I use the word might in quotations and in, and in capital letters because you have slopes in the back side of the site. You have wetlands that have been mapped, although they were mapped probably 10 years ago and need to be remapped. And you probably have vernal pools. So from a permitting standpoint, there would be a lot of research to do to find out if there is enough land that you could use outright in that back area or through uh, wetlands mitigation, that kind of thing. But the idea of having another school on the campus would be great, just in terms of the, you know, you have five buildings on the campus now, including town hall and the, and the town library. So it, 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 from a you know, sort of urban planning standpoint, it would be a great thing to do if, if the land worked. And then we're showing that, that dark line, we're showing uh, building a road that would go down the slope and connect the Sawyer Road at the back. So now the middle school and uh, the back side of the campus and this potential consolidated school would have a second access to the campus. And I think that that's pretty important for the middle school, particularly because you have one driveway. All it would take would be a car accident to block that driveway and then a fire would start at the same time. Maybe improbable, but it, it's, you know, it's, uh, it would be great to have another way uh, in and out of that site from the, from the middle school. So, so we showed, um, I mean, there's no plan for that yet. We haven't been asked to design anything. What we did is we looked at uh, a project that we recently opened up in Corinth, a new elementary school, state funded, and we used the square feet per student number that that building ended up having and, and the dollar per square foot number that that building ended up having. It's a DOE funded project. So again, it's, it's not um, an excessive amount of money. It's, it's conservative in terms of both the space that they allocated for it and, and, and the cost of it. And then on page 19, we did we did real real rough numbers. And I don't want anybody to be concerned about these numbers because this could be plus or minus 20 percent um, at, at this point. But what we did is we we said, all right, if you um, if you believe in the planning decisions projections, then you ought to build that school for at least 
750 students because by 2025, that's what planning the business says will have in the building. You might even think about it being larger because if those numbers are correct, then you wouldn't have any capacity for growth there. So we, we used the multiple dollar per square foot that was at Corinth and we threw some money in there for site work and an estimating contingency. And then we ran all the numbers down in the standard Department of Ed uh, budget format and came up with you know just over $50 million. And it, again, this isn't, this isn't a bid, this is, this is a, a master plan approximation. Could it be 40? Might be. Could it be 45? Might be that as well. But, but you'd have to do all the normal research that you would need to do in order to actually program it, draw it, and, and, and then budget it. And again, when this happens, uh, you know, it could be five years from now. I mean, you know, it's just the purpose of a master plan is to model all these things so that then decision makers can have the information that they need to make decisions. So that is uh, option D. Option E looks at the, at the middle school. So you'd renovate and expand the middle school to right size all those program space shortages that we talked about and to replace those 12 modular classrooms with new permanent uh, construction. So if you look at page 20, look at page 20 of your hand now, there's a site plan. So we're showing the road, this new road access for both uh, building potentials because we just think that that would be a good thing to have overall for your campus. And once you remove and replace the, the Passamaquoddy modulars, you end up freeing up a whole bunch of space for parking. But shortage of parking is something that, uh, that all the schools have. So we added some additional parking, and we're showing uh, wings that, that could be added onto the building to take care of those program issues. So if you look at page 21. Hey, Dan, you and, Sorry. Yes. Any reason why you wouldn't just cut straight across? and go into Sawyer instead of running it through that uh, long line. Uh, we're following the contours and, and it's, it may be hard to see, <laughs> it may be hard to see at all on the, on the screen, um, but the area where the shaded areas on the, on the right hand side, uh, there's a, in the past there were a lot of wetlands that were mapped there and uh, pretty steep contours. So we, we, we put the road in a, in a, in a direction that you know, the contours were gentler and where they looked like there was uplands rather than wetlands. But you certainly could, would study that. You know, the, uh, step one would be to map the wetlands and the vernal pools and to know what you have on the site and then to figure out the most cost-effective way to do that. Which I now know what vernal pools are. I learned all about them. <laughs> 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 There's a pair of water. <laughs> Okay, so here's the floor plan of the, of the middle school, and, and thank you, Julie. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, days there much longer, I'm just going to pat her on the head. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the 12 classrooms at Tatham Aquati, this, this is a classroom wing that has six classrooms on two floors. So, the first thing we wanted to do is to connect it physically to the existing building. Because the fact that Pastor McQuaddy is separate and the security issues and the building management issues that that represents is, is, is really, uh, really a pain. So connecting it back to the building, there's already a hallway system over here to get to the gym. So we, simply, we would simply be picking up on that hallway system, extending it out and putting a two-story wing there. And then we're showing that you could actually put another two-story wing over here by extending that hallway around the end of the gym if at some point in the future you, you felt the need to do that. It expands the cafeteria, it expands the kitchen, it expands admin, uh, some additional space for guidance. You know, the, the additional classrooms, you, you, you would try to optimize the spaces with functions better for the entire plan, and that would be part of the, part of the planning system. And then up on the second floor, We have that classroom wing, and again, this, this shaded area right here is basically a notch in the plan uh, on two floors. So we would basically fill that in two stories, and uh, that would probably be, would become special ed space or something something like that. There's, there's no good way. Isn't that part of the library? Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, that's right, because the library is uh, 850 square feet smaller than it should be, so that's a place where you can expand the library. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the second floor of this new classroom wing doesn't connect easily to the rest of the plan. Uh, there's, the, there's that track and the uh, middle school gymnasium, so it would be awkward, it may be a security issue to have kids patch from this classroom wing through the gym, then they'd have to go through the library and, and into the, the, the main central hall where the stair is. So it would probably be better in this situation to just have stairs on either end of that wing, and they would have to go down in order to go into the rest of the building. But it, it's something that you could uh, something you could look at. Yeah. Yeah. And Christy, <coughs> was there any talk at all about making the middle school an elementary school? and then building a new middle school? Maybe there hasn't been, but there middle could be. Pardon me? There hasn't been any discussion that, that we've been a part of, but it could be. I mean, you can, at this point, it just I just, I just happen to think of this now, so it, I, I would like that to go back to the committee, and let me tell you the reason. If we had to do all of this renovation to make it adequate as a middle school, is it adequate space for elementary age children? What grade exactly? Well, no, K two. Well, you can't put them up on the second floor. Sure you can. Uh, well, second graders you can, but not yeah. the K one. Right. So. Yeah. Also, the library is on the second floor. Library. Right. It, it could be looked at Jackie, pretty quickly and easily. The, the, the code the code doesn't allow kindergarten and first graders to be on the second floor uh, unless they have a special dedicated stairway for their emergency egress, which is almost impossible to do. And the reason is because the, the code is afraid that bigger kids may trample the smaller kids in an emergency. So all your core spaces in, in K-1 schools have to be on the first floor. So okay. In this case, it wouldn't that Thank you. Would work so well. And I just want to remind everyone that was one of the major problems with Wentworth was yeah. that it was designed for middle school and junior high and it was being used for 3-5 and it was not appropriately sized like water fountains were too tall seats you know nothing was the right size for an intermediate kids. Right. so right. we run into all that again. <coughs> so on page 23 we did a budget for this and again same thing just Simple all per square foot, make some assumptions about the, the amount of work that might be required. That, that came to about uh, $14 million, including the road going down to Sawyer. And when you run the numbers out, uh, that might be you know $18 million or, or, or thereabouts uh, if you're just going to address the, uh, the middle school uh, issues. So the, the other option that was uh, talked about, or has been talked about, which is that's page page 16 or 17 was um, option F which be to expand Wentworth uh, and, and move the sixth grade into the building and this was something that that we looked at last year and we looked at it uh, originally not adding on to Wentworth but just seeing if there was enough space in the building to move the um, sixth grade out of the middle school into Wentworth, therefore, thereby uh, reducing the stress on the building at the, at the middle school. It would become a two-grade building instead of a three-grade building. And we did a, we did a drawing for that as well. Uh, but it, it didn't work. It was, um, what we ended up doing is taking all the rooms that, that had been originally planned for various functions, and uh, we basically had the commandeer special ed spaces and, and other spaces in the building just to come up with a, a minimum classroom count to take care of those kids because the sixth grade has about 11 classrooms in the middle school right now. Yes, Chris. So, Dan, I also recall, and maybe this changed as you looked at on the other end too, possibly moving second grade there and then closing one of the local schools and then consolidating K and one first and others with it. Is that off the table? Or? Well, that was done as a part when, when we had projections that said that your K2 population was going to like drop steadily mm -hmm. and that you were going to end up with, with much too much square footage in your inventory. That was part of part of that discussion. It, now, it's the, now it seems to be the other way around. 
So we, we did this plan, and on the second floor of this plan, which is your page 25, the second floor, we have the uh, fifth grade in the upper part and the sixth grade uh, in, the, in the lower part. But again, uh, when, we, when we met with Kelly, uh, it, it just basically you would map out the entire building you have more kids than you really had space for it. You, the building was designed for about 800 kids. You'd have well in excess of 900 kids uh, if you did that. And we started looking at <coughs> things like, well, do you even have enough available sections, say in art or in music, uh, in a given week to take care of all those all those kids? And, and so it, 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 it just just really maxed out the building too much. However, if you were to add four, maybe six classrooms, say to the end of that wing, and there's room out there for it, the, the driveway that goes around the back of Wentworth was pulled away from the building in order to allow for expansion in the future, then you could put more classroom space in, but the core space crowding might still be an issue from the scheduling standpoint. And, and so if anything like that was ever considered, you'd really have to look at that scheduling issue in, in some detail. Um, so those those were this sort were of where the options stand at this uh, at this point. And um, so the last piece of this is looking at finding funding uh, for for these these projects. If you go back to page 17, the, the DOE uh, last took applications for state funded projects in 2010-11, and they just announced uh, three or four months ago that they're going to do it again now, finally six years later. So the way that it, uh, the way it's going to work is the applications are now available online. Uh, they're due on April 14th of 2017. Uh, from May to December of 2017, the Department of Ed team will go and visit every single school that applied and in detail and basically come up with a scoring system using, they have a set of criteria that's published on, on the web. Uh, and they would visit and, and start their scoring system. From January to March of 2018, they would do their final scoring and then they would publish the list, you know, late spring, uh, March, April of 2018, maybe going into the summer. And at that point, you would know whether or not you ranked high enough on the list that you might get state funding at some point in, in the future. And if, you, if you do get high up on that list, it's, it's really worth the application because uh, it, just, it could be a substantial uh, uh, amount of money for you. In the last round, in 2010, there were 71 schools that applied, and so far they funded 14 of those 71. I don't know if they're going to keep going down the list uh, beyond 14 or not, but 14 or 15 is probably is, is, is as many as you might expect, uh, given the shortages of funding. It's, it's, it's a function of the Department of Ed and the state deciding that they're going to open up more bond capacity for borrowing for more and more schools that they get on the list. But it's uh, definitely worth doing, and uh, we'll work with Todd uh, after the new year and start preparing the application. And the, good, the good news is that you have the data for the application uh, already because you've done this master plan. And the state will require you to do separate applications for each of the primary schools and the middle school. And then they, if you get high up on the list, they decide whether or not they want you to combine schools or renovate uh, some in place. Uh, but it's, it's highly likely, I think there's like a 99% chance that if you got to the top, near the top of the list, that they would expect you to uh, consolidate the primary schools. So, and that's about as much as we know at this, at this point. So the rest of the stuff that's in this package is just existing drawings and again good reading and a holiday. <laughs> So thank you so much for this. This package is amazing. Um, just in the interest of time, I'd like to limit comments or questions just to the school board. If anyone has any specific questions for Dan. No, but I, I thank you, Dan, for hanging in there with us because we really went from one place to a completely different place yeah. in about six months. So. Right. So well, it's true that you know and didn't close the school. After, <laughs> after the planning decisions update, yeah. I think that shed new light. So, yeah. again, very appreciative of all the time that you've put in with all of us mm -hmm. on the committee and, and that. So, thank you.
Thank you. It's fun to do. <laughs> it's it's eye opening. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So. And I'm glad we went back because of all the new housing that's projected yeah. to be built in Scarborough and the new neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, and, and thank you to Dan Bacon because he was yeah. uh, quite helpful with all of our Usually meetings and, and finding out where the new housing starts were and how right. many building permits and all that. So yeah. that definitely helped enlighten us a little more. Yeah. So. Jackie? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you for this in-depth study. And I now expect it because you do such a great job. Well, thank that. you. <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, please. I think that I suggest that the board have, have a workshop just devoted to this, nothing else on the agenda. Yeah. Separate workshop to talk about options. And then I think we should have a second workshop on this topic with the town council. When we have decided which way we might wish to go, then we need to sit down with the council to see how they're feeling about it. I agree with Dan go ahead and put in the applications mm -hmm. but our chances of getting you know last time they said that our buildings are absolutely the cleanest buildings they had ever seen and we never got on the list so but I'm not saying don't <laughs> clean the buildings <laughs> but that was for the old Wentworth but you know it's interesting yeah. a place like Falmouth they consolidated and they got funding Bre Brewer did as well so I went to the Brewer school I think really it nice. really kind of depends on what the situation is. So yes. there yeah. like to hope that we could get on a list and get some money. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. worth applying. Again, it's it, it, it adds a year to whatever you might do, but it's really worth it because if nothing else, if you don't get funding then you can tell the community, okay, we've tried a conventional right. funding route and it's not going to be available to us, so now let's talk about what we might do mm -hmm. instead. Well and um, a couple of two key points actually. Um, yes, we do have to apply for each building because we're not we're not um, applying for a solution. We're identifying the problems in each of our buildings, and so it doesn't. It's not about how clean our buildings are, but it's it's a very specific criteria of is there health risks, are there constructural risks, um, and that's how the points are allocated. But by applying, although it is labor intensive, and and Todd will do a great job with Dan's support. I am confident. It does um, hold us harmless for the current conditions of our building so that when those five boilers do go and we decide to replace them with a more energy efficient solution or um, um, any other improvements we make, adding new windows, things like that, so we can have some short term gains, um, it doesn't change our status with the DOE. So we'll still be on that list along with the um, 50 some others that did not get funded in the last round. But um, my hope, my, the ultimate optimism in me is that everyone else will be discouraged by the process and we'll be at the top of the list. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the other thing is, if you compare the construction of our middle school with the construction of this building, uh, there's no comparison. Mm -hmm. Because when we built the middle school, we had to build it to their specs, number one, and number two, we had to use the contractor that came in with the the lowest bid. Well, that's what we and did. And we, we had no control over that. That's and at least the last two projects we've had, if you look at this building and you look at our high school, uh, the there's no comparison to the level of work uh, that was produced the b two buildings that were produced even though we had to pay for them. At least we controlled the construction. This was the lowest bid too. This was. This well, was. Yeah. Yeah. And then they came in three billion dollars. Yeah. <coughs> Jody? Did you have something to add? I just wanted to thank Todd too because it sounds like he's doing some miracle work with um, in those the buildings that we have in town. Yeah. So, and thank you for this report. It, it is sort of fascinating to read what's happening and the depth that you've got into in this. Mm -hmm. So, thank you for that. Yeah. And I, you know, if, if you want to continue uh, with some workshops, and we, we would welcome that. I think uh, uh, take some time to just absorb this information. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a smaller piece, of a bigger piece of it, of an overall study. But um, mm -hmm. any 
since we have all this data now, it's really easy to model other options, draw other things, you know, do some brainstorming uh, with the community and uh, see where you want to go. Great. Thank you so much for hanging in with us. And thank you, everyone, for staying at the um, longest school board meeting ever. Well, that's what I was just going to say. This is no, possibly the most ambitious agenda that's been assembled, so way to go. But I'm going to suggest that we table uh, 7.3 to brainstorm ideas for continuous improvement for our students and facilities because I think we have um, absorbed a lot tonight and wouldn't be so good at pumping out ideas. So um, I'm Yes. Along with the because I think that they some information that they might not have. Yep. And thank everybody for coming. Mm -hmm. And with that, I will take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All in favor? <laughs> thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. <laughs> this is a lot.